Thank you indeed, Kelsey and Daniel, and thank you, colleagues, friends, especially the schools. It's such a pleasure to see across the generations in this event. Indeed, this is a very special occasion for us, and I want to acknowledge the inputs of so many different people leading to today. So again, my sincere thanks to you all for being here. It really is a very special occasion. I'm slightly nervous now that Professor Teen has cranked up the expectations of this chair. But in fact, fortunately, it's more than me that is going to be involved in the implementation of all of this. It's a, an occasion for partnership. It's an occasion where people across a great spectrum are involved in what we are doing. What I am going to do is run through aspects of the history leading up to today and indeed elaborating on dimensions of the UNESCO mission and how they converge with the Hong Kong University mission. So I'm going to begin with telling you the structure of what I'm going to talk about. I will tell you about UNESCO a bit more. We've already had a synopsis of UNESCO and what it is and what it does. But those of us who are teachers know that it's a good idea to say things more than once and to structure it again. I will talk a little bit about my own personal history and to again elaborate on the journey to IIEP, the International Institute for Educational Planning, and back, and how it is that the University of Hong Kong did bring me back, Steve Andrews and his team. I will talk more about the Education for All agenda, EFA agenda, and Education for Sustainable Development, to explain that and let you see how important they are. And then to say something about how we see the UNESCO chair as a community, as a group of us working with UNESCO, with other partners to achieve the objectives. UNESCO, you've already heard a bit about it. UNESCO as the educational, scientific and cultural organization. We have colleagues here in the University of Hong Kong working on science. Among the vice presidents of the UNESCO Hong Kong Association, Professor Jiang Yu Zhong, it's a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Jiang, as a scientist and working with us. Culture, we have Dr. Darwin Chen also working very much uh, locally. The his history of Hong Kong's culture, to some extent, is embodied in you and your work. But education is the main focus of what we are doing here. The schools, I wonder if you took time to look at what the schools are doing. And if you didn't, then please do on the way out. There are these wonderful displays of what the schools are doing with the Hong Kong UNESCO Association, and indeed with our faculty. And some of the things that you will see there are bridging education and culture. Look also at the display of our colleague, Dr. Ng Fong Peng, about the intangible cultural heritage, the Cantonese opera, which again is bridging the culture and education. UNESCO, as you heard, was established in 1945 in the period as the Second World War was coming to a conclusion, and it is headquartered in Paris, but has this global network of field offices, cluster offices, regional bureau, and institutes. So although it's headquartered in Paris, it's a truly global organization, which has national commissions in most ministries of education and which also has a network of NGOs. That is indeed how the UNESCO Hong Kong Association fits in with the UNESCO structure. Also as part of the NGO body is the World Council of Comparative Education Societies, which you heard about. That is an umbrella body which brings together 40 national, regional, and language-based comparative education societies. 
It includes, we have a Hong Kong society of which the office bearers are also in this room. The World Council of Comparative Education Society, thank you Steve for saying something about the role of the Comparative Education Research Centre. It has supported the World Council, it has been the Secretariat of the World Council, and we continue to play a role in it. And so that is among the NGOs which somehow fit together with the broad UNESCO family. This is a quotation from a recent book by a man called J.P. Singh about the vision of UNESCO back in 1945 to accommodate a multi-actor and a multipolar world. The author felt that it was incredibly prescient, uh, far-reaching and uh, visionary to see a multipolar world. The other United Nations organizations were not set up in quite the same way. Now, this person, J.P. Singh, is an academic, so he's a careful man, and he does say UNESCO's attempt to do this. <laughs> Nothing is simple. Uh, UNESCO does it. It has all of these actors. Among the challenges is indeed making it work. But UNESCO has been set up as a, an organization with a secretariat, but a huge network which, through this UNESCO chair, we are gaining links and becoming part of that network. So, the system of UNESCO chairs, you've already heard a little bit about that. They were launched, as you've already heard, in 1992 for all dimensions of UNESCO's work in education and science and in culture. And in the education sector, we have chairs now in 74 of the member states. Uh, the Hong Kong Institute of Education also has a chair. Uh, Rupert McLean is the chair holder. Rupert, it's a pleasure to have you with us today. Rupert is a colleague in the UNESCO system. While I was director of the IIEP, he was in charge of something called UNIVOC, the UNESCO uh, body responsible for vocational education and training in Bonn, Germany. And the vision of these UNESCO chairs is that indeed they are seen as think tanks, bridge builders between the academic world and civil so society communities, bringing research, bringing policy makers together. I have to say that that was among the dimensions which I have, over my career, found very valuable. So just telling you a little bit more about my own personal history, which has led to where I am at this moment. Uh, I've been associated with UNESCO since the 80s in various capacities. I've worked as a consultant on different UNESCO projects, as an academic, I have written various reports, documents, publications for UNESCO. This continued in the 90s, but indeed, as has been mentioned several times, it was in the last decade that Hong Kong U did give me leave without pay, secondment, to go to IIEP in Paris, where I did work as its director for four years. So I want to tell you a little bit about IIEP and how that fits into things. IIEP was created itself in 1963 on a special and distinctive model. It has its own governing board which oversees the mission of IIEP within the UNESCO framework. The first director was a very visionary man called Philip Coombs, who set up the IIEP on a distinctive model. It's also headquartered in Paris, but not in the same building as the UNESCO headquarters. It's at a safe distance, the other side of the river, uh, separate from headquarters, but in fact within walking distance, and so separate but related. 
and in addition having a branch in Buenos Aires in Argentina. So it's a, an institute with two offices. We were responsible, IIP is responsible for training policy advice and research. And as you look at those dimensions, you can think about here in the University of Hong Kong. We do very much the same sort of things, albeit with different labels. We certainly do teaching, we do research, we have our knowledge exchange, our consultancy uh, relationships. One of the things that I found going to IIEP, going to UNESCO, among these special attributes was the close links with governments. I was able to work much more closely with governments and it also gave me a rather different perspective on performance indicators. Uh, here in Hong Kong University we think about how we measure our research, our teaching, our knowledge exchange. We had to do the same things, but in slightly different ways in IIEP. Well, as indeed my period did draw to a close, there was the obvious question of what I would bring back and how both sides could benefit. And you're beginning to get the message that this UNESCO chair is part of the answer. It is a way in which we can have a bridge between our university, the academic world, and the UNESCO body. From there, I want to turn to the third part of what I want to share with you this evening. The UNESCO flagship programs. I'm glad that Professor Jean found them on the website. I'm glad he found them inspiring. They are inspiring. They're also challenging. Education for All is one of the major ones, and Education for Sustainable Development is the second one, which I am going to talk about. The Education for All movement, it has been mentioned, but let me be a bit more explicit. It was beginning in 1990. The EFA movement was set up in a place called Jong Tien in Thailand. It was reinforced in Dakar, Senegal, in the year 2000. And they have set the year 2015, as you have heard, for the EFA goals. Now, we're already in 2012, and so we are already in the season of thinking, OK, uh, how, how much have we achieved, and what shall we be doing in the next period? What are the goals? I was glad to hear Professor Cheen feel that they are inspiring. Six of them, they are demanding, they are broad, they concern all levels of education from early childhood through higher education to adult education. They concern not only quantity but also quality. They themselves dovetail with the United Nations Millennium Development Goals. You perhaps know that there are eight of these, and indeed, around the Hong Kong U campus, there have been different stands representing each of the eight goals. That's part of our own awareness for the students. I see Albert Chow nodding because it's partly <coughs> Peter's responsibility that uh, put them there, and I think it's indeed excellent. Among these UN goals, number two is there as to achieve universal primary education. The goal of ensuring that every child of primary school age has access to attends and completes good quality primary education. Now that might seem to be a fairly basic goal, but it still has not been achieved and indeed will not be achieved by 2015. We've come a long way, but we haven't yet achieved all of that goal. In terms of progress and challenges, we are in a period of stock-taking now. 2012 is only three years from the 2015 target. 
it is clear that a great deal has been achieved. In terms of quantity, in terms of quality also, a great deal has been achieved. But there are still 70 million children of primary school age who are not in primary school. Where are they? They are especially in South Asia, they're especially in Africa. But they are also in other parts of the world as well. It's clear that the EFA agenda, the Millennium Development Goals, also have pushed us further than would otherwise have been the case. A great deal has been achieved, but it's also been a problem that Education for All, which was the six broad objectives, has been boiled down to UPE. It's been boiled down, reduced to just primary education for all. So on the one hand, we still have 70 million people who are out of school and we want to get them in school. On the other hand, when it becomes just universal primary education, there is a feeling that for some countries, well, we have done that. Hong Kong included, China pretty much, Malaysia, uh, Indonesia, many of the countries in this region feel, well, we have achieved that. And because of that, the Millennium Development Goals have become seen as somewhat irrelevant to many states, which is a bit unfortunate. The EFA goals are broad, the EFA goals are absolutely relevant. But when they get reduced to universal primary education, some states say, well, this is something we've already done. Now, this is very current stuff, and it happens that indeed last week the UNESCO office in Bangkok convened a high-level expert meeting to look at the agenda. Professor Tingaiming and I were there, as was Anatoly Alexienko. We felt very proud that Hong Kong U had three people in quite a small group and a very important group. Asia has taken the lead in addressing the question about the EFA agenda. And in this meeting in Bangkok, we were saying, OK, so what has been achieved and how should it be shaped and reshaped beyond 2015? The meeting was mainly to focus on Asia, but it also focused on other parts of the world. We were aware that we would have implications for other parts. It led to the conclusion that certainly we have an unfinished broad agenda on education for all, including universalization of primary education, those children that are not in school. But we need to have a renewed global vision still fitting into the Millennium Development Goals, recognizing local contexts, recognizing that, in particular, if it becomes quality education for all, that is an agenda for us in Hong Kong, agenda for us in the rest of China, agenda for the rich countries as well as for the poor countries. So that leads me to one core concern that I am particularly interested in, uh, and that is the equity agenda. I think that we are all interested in the equity agenda. But the equity agenda is going to be the one which is really capable of uniting countries across the globe and bringing the UNESCO mission to uh, countries of all income groups. The equity issue is something for us in Hong Kong as much as in other parts of the world. Which leads me then to the question of what are we doing here in Hong Kong U? 